Thanks for joining us and welcome to the first webinar in a series for the uh, Western Governors Association National Forest and Rangeland Management Initiative. This webinar is titled Managing Electricity Reliability Risks on Forest and Rangeland. So once again, thanks for joining. This is Bill Whitaker with WGA and I'm just going to touch on a couple technical issues before we start. Um, so if you need any assistance for any reason throughout technical assistance throughout the webinar, please uh, contact Amy Schweig through the WebEx app or you can call the WGA main office at 303-623-9378 and we'll do our best to solve that problem. Um, there's also, uh, you'll notice that on the right hand side there is a chat function. Um, we, you can use that to contact Amy and then also when we come to the Q&A portion of the webinar you can use that to submit questions. Please submit them to me, Dan Baer and uh, the, the host and aside from that our general format um, we're going to start with a few opening remarks from WGA staff and then moving on to opening remarks from our moderator and panelists moving on then to about 30 minutes of moderated discussion and then 20 minutes of question and answers from you at the end so um, please don't hesitate to ask any questions or contact us with any issues I thank you for coming and I'm going to turn it off to Troy Timmons the WGA lead on the project. Um, thank you, Bill. And I'll just uh, add some really quick context uh, around the discussion that we're going to have today. Um, the Forest and Rangeland Management Initiative is uh, the initiative of our chair, um, Governor Steve Bullock of Montana. And uh, what Governor Bullock wants, wants us to do through this initiative is, is take a region-wide look at uh, several aspects of uh, land management throughout the western states. Um, and specifically, he wanted to, us to, to look closely at uh, basically at four main goals in mind. The first was to provide an opportunity for states to look at what's working and what's not working uh, with land management um, and not just at the federal level but also with with state management and management of private lands as well um, and management by local governments. Um, so that was the first goal. The second is to take a look at um, collaborative processes and how uh, different groups working together can reach consensus and in many cases not consensus on uh, moving forward with land management priorities. Uh, the third one is to take a look at existing statutory tools and how those can help um, assist with land management priorities and um, are there other tools out there that, or, or changes that need to be made um, to how those authorities work in order to allow them to operate more efficiently? And fourth, um, the fourth goal being after you've looked at all of those other areas, uh, what are the changes, if any, that you need to make just in terms of of management um, or on a regulatory basis or even a statutory basis to make those land management uh, activities uh, operate more efficiently and more easily. Where vegetation management comes in and, and why it's an exciting issue to kick off the webinar series, um, there is an enormous amount of uh, effect, impact that vegetation management can have on um, the resilience of surrounding landscapes to wildfire. Um, proper vegetation management uh, can mitigate a lot of fire danger. Um, and then there's the flip side of it, which is uh, doing what you can with vegetation management in order uh, so that when a fire does occur, you've, you've done everything you can to keep those, uh, keep those lines up and keep the power moving. 
And so um, we've got a great panel set up uh, for this afternoon. We really appreciate everybody, um, both the panelists for taking the time to do this and for all of you that are listening. We really appreciate your participation. With that, I'll turn it back to Bill. And uh, again, we appreciate your time. Um, yeah, thank you, Troy. And actually from here, I'd like to hand it off to our moderator, Ann Beard, um, and she'll be leading us uh, she'll, through the discussion with our panelists. So, Ann? Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you for everybody joining us this, this afternoon. Um, when Bill called last week and asked about moderating this panel, I wasn't quite sure what, what it was all about, but it seems to have come together and hopefully it will be uh, very useful for the uh, folks that have joined us on the line. Um, as Bill and Troy said, I think we have a really good panel lined up um, for you and uh, hopefully we'll cover a lot of different topics, but there's always an opportunity for you to ask an um, individual question as uh, stated earlier in this um, webinar by using the um, Q&A um, function on the webinar. So. I'm going to talk, uh, give a few uh, remarks regarding um, my personal experience um, in my position as the uh, system forester here at Public Service Company of New Mexico, and um, then each of the panelists will have a turn to also offer some opening remarks, and we'll get into the moderated discussion. So um, up on the screen, you should hopefully see um, a slide presentation. This is. Um, uh, taken from a, another presentation that I've given, but I've kind of tailored it for the um, time frame that we have available here. So the New Mexico landscape, for those of you who are not familiar with New Mexico, um, my company, Public Service Company of New Mexico, or PNM, maintains over uh, 14,000 miles of transmission and distribution lines across the state, the majority of which is located in the northern half of our state. As you can see, over 40% of the land in New Mexico in, that, in our service territory is owned by um, federal, state, or tribal or Pueblo entities. So that presents, that in and of itself presents quite a few um, challenges for us as we're doing um, our vegetation management across our rights of way. Next slide. So one of the issues, um, that we had in recent years involved um, our compliance with our uh, federal reliability standard, um, that being the FAC 03 uh, version one um, standard that we had. In September of 20, 2011, we found a tree that was located on one of our 345 lines that was within seven feet, eight inches, and um, Thus, at that time, under the um, old standard, version one, was a violation. Um, at the time, our company interpreted that um, the standard is such that if we took care of any kind of a clearance um, violation, um, meaning removing the tree or removing the hazard or removing the violation, that we weren't in violation of the standard. We came to find out a couple of years later on a webinar with WEC that that in fact was un, not necessarily an accurate um, interpretation of the standard. And after that, we found that out, we actually made a self-report to our reliability organization, which is WEC, and had to file a mitigation plan, which included numerous milestones in order to ensure that a clearance violation of, of that type would not happen again. Next slide. Uh, so some of the concerns that we had with our program was that we were um, unsure of the accuracy of our existing patrol methods. That particular tree that you saw on the previous slide had been, we figured, patrolled maybe five, maybe six times over the years and in that state, in that violation state, and still was not detected using our existing patrol methods, which mainly consisted of aerial patrols and ground patrols. Um, we risked additional uh, clearance violations. We risked an outage, too, um, in, in uh, situations like that. We were concerned about the cost, and of course, as uh, was earlier mentioned, or 
risk of wildfire. We did not want to be the ignition source of, of a catastrophic wildfire. And so we knew we had to change things. Next slide. Our existing program at the time was very reactive. Uh, it consisted of doing patrols, either aerially or ground patrols, finding uh, situations that needed to be worked um, and taking care of those using hand control methods, um, uh, cutting with uh, chainsaws and or um, using backpack sprayers. Next slide. Um, so what we found on our rights of way um, after doing a thorough ground patrol is that we had a lot of uh, vegetation that was unmanaged. Now, for some folks maybe back east or in other parts of the country, this may not seem like a really big deal, but for us, we've never really had a, a management program where we managed all the vegetation on our entire right of way. Next slide. So we had a lot of um, concerns about trees growing on our right of way. In this particular slide, you can see that there was an example of some reactive work where we might have identified a tree or a clump of trees that were getting close to the line and we um, removed the trees and or left the brush on site depending on the land ownership and the desires of those uh, landowners. Next slide. We had a lot of encroachment. I'm sure these lines were probably cleared upon construction of the lines many, many years ago, but um, a lot of times they hadn't been maintained since then. Next slide. There was um, trees of concern, trees leaning in from outside the right-of-way that, you know, if they fell could have caused an interruption or could have, you know, caused a violation. Next slide. And so we had a challenge, how do we clear all of our rights of way um, and maintain uh, compliance um, such that we don't have any violations. Also, we were uh, concerned about the upcoming revision of our reliability standard um, that was happening back in 2014. And so we decided to implement a maintenance program um, that would address all of those concerns. Next slide. So the first thing we needed to do was to actually patrol our lines um, using something that would be uh, more accurate than what we had been doing. And so we decided to have um, our lines flown and LIDAR data collected on all of our NERC FAC 03 lines, which would be all of our 200 kV and above lines. So this is an example of some of the data that we collected. The top part of the slide shows um, an example of all the polygons that were um, submitted to us from our um, LIDAR company, which assessed all the heights of the trees and clearances of the trees between the uh, top of the vegetation and the conductors themselves. The bottom part of this slide actually shows a point cloud uh, with all the uh, thousands upon thousands of points of data that was collected during the patrol. You'll see um, images of brush and trees along our rights of way. If you see off to the right there, there is a particular tree that would be of concern because if it had fallen, that tree would have contacted the outside conductor. And the part of the crown that actually would have touched the conductor is shaded in a slightly darker color there, kind of a reddish brown color. That same tree is identified in the top part of that slide in the orangish color. That's the way we identified those trees of concern on our patrol. Next slide. Here's another view. You can see a closer view of the polygon on the top part of the slide in the orangish color. And then the bottom slide is the um, kind of a profile view using the point cloud of that same tree. There's also a measurement taken there that shows us exactly how close that particular part of that tree is to the conductor. So basically we got a, a lot of highly um, accurate data that we used to then um, come up with prescriptions for all of our lines and then we could get out there and attack um, the highest priority work first. Next slide. So here's a particular line that we had. It's a very, very long line that goes out to the eastern part of our state and serves our wind farm. Um, this particular line was constructed probably in the 1970s, I think, but had never been maintained. You can see that we had to 
um, clear um, about 100 feet on this. I know we had a 150 foot wide right of way, um, but we felt that getting that 100 feet would probably get us uh, where we need to be, and that was to have a clear right of way, a clear view um, on patrols, and to um, reduce the uh, risk of wildfire. Next slide. So the project benefits, um, obviously compliance was one of our top concerns. Um, we feel we're well on our way to meeting the compliance, especially with the new standard that came into effect in July of 2014 that requires all companies to manage all of the vegetation on their rights of way. Um, we are looking to reduce our O&M costs over time. Um, we're hardening our system. We're also reducing the fire risk by removing those trees that are high fire risk uh, trees. And also we're looking to improve our um, habitat, specifically pollinator habitat, by reducing those in invasive species and allowing the more beneficial plants to flourish on our right of way. Next slide. So um, one other unique aspect of our program is that um, all 100% of our um, work is um, screened through our environmental management system. Um, certain jobs require additional screening and requires permits to be uh, prepared and clearances to be issued. Um, this applies to many of the uh, jobs that we have for vegetation management. Next slide. So uh, construction projects, all construction projects, whether that be vegetation management or line projects, if they're greater than a million dollars in, in value, then um, there's a process that we all go through. Um, environmental services is a part of that project team from the very beginning to, to ensure that we're meeting compliance with all uh, federal and state regulations. And any construction project less than a million dollars in value um, there's an actual a screening portal that um, work order riders can can um, access, and also they can self-screen, and um, they'll get certain general stipulations and and maybe some other stipulations depending on where they're loca uh, located, where the work is located, in order to ensure compliance. Next slide. And there's a um, what what has been deemed called uh, hot zones within our service territory. And that's basically identifying all sensitive areas, whether that be uh, due to its location or due to cultural resources or landmarks or whether they're located on um, tribal lands, et cetera. Um, that's a, a layer in our GIS system that all people, everyone in the, in the company have, has access to now. It's not going to tell you exactly what that sensitive area is or why it's deemed sensitive, but it will let you know that um, it's important that you get environmental clearance prior to starting work in that area. Next slide. So there is an environmental data model that goes along with this environmental management system. Um, right away in renewals have prompted cultural and biological inventories on all pre-NEPA lines. We're running into a lot of that with this particular project for vegetation clearance. Um, there's a geodatabase that stores all this, called cultural, biological, and access road inventory data. Next slide. Um, this is an example of an, a clearance document that would be issued to the uh, project lead, um, and it would have general stipulations on there that apply to just about every job, and then it would also have special stipulations such as whether or not it's required environmental monitoring or whether there's avoidance areas. Next slide. So for this particular project, there's 19 different transmission lines of 200 kV and above. Um, there were some other um, lines deemed as critical that aren't necessarily, don't necessarily fall under the FACO3 um, rule but it's a total of over 1,000 miles. The idea is using integrated vegetation management principles um, in finding the best tool for the job. Next slide. Um, as a result of our project, there's been another 215 miles of previously unsurveyed 
federal, state, and tribal lands and approximately 235 new archaeological sites that have been identified to date. Next slide. Next slide. And so we're, that's all I have um, on this particular, um, on our particular project. Um, I would like to go ahead and move on to the next panelist for their opening remarks, and that would be Randy Miller, who is the Director of Education Management at Pacific Corps. Randy? Thanks, Ann. Uh, Pacific Corps serves six western states, uh, parts of Northern California, Oregon, Eastern Washington, Eastern Idaho, most of Utah, and most of Wyoming. We also have a transmission line that goes from Billings, Montana to Yellowtail, Wyoming, and we have about 16,000 miles of overhead transmission lines and 45,000 miles of distribution lines. Uh, my intent with my opening remarks is to talk about some best practices for integrated vegetation management. You can advance a slide, please. Uh, I wrote the best practices for integrated vegetation management for the International Society of Arboriculture. And of course, having done that, I could speak for a long time on it. But ultimately, what it boils down to is a common sense approach that says that for utilities, we should not be growing any types of species that at any time in their life will interfere with the conductor. Um, and talked about some of the requirements from FAC 003, the Federal Vegetation Management Standard for Utilities. They have a clearance requirement. So the idea would be not to grow any species or allow any species in the right of way that at any time in their life could grow into that encroachment zone that is forbidden by the Vegetation Management Standard, plus a, a margin of error, you know, a, 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 a space that uh, would allow work thresholds to begin work before a tree ever got close to interfering. So the idea is to use a common sense approach and selectively remove trees. And what we are trying to promote is the idea of stop looking at the uh, transmission rights away or, or utility rights away as sacrifice areas and begin to look at them as areas of opportunity that can be managed for other plant communities to supply habitat for pollinators, for uh, small mammals, for lizards, for songbirds, and that sort of thing. Because meadow plant communities, prairie plant communities are lacking, and in some cases almost extinct in some states. Advance the slide, please. So a important concept in that is the wire zone, border zone, and basically what it says is underneath the line, if the line's not very high off the ground, we would grow a meadow plant community or a prairie plant community. Off to the side, we might be able to grow small uh, trees or tall growing shrubs that, again, would never in their lifetime grow into an encroachment zone. And you can see some arcs there underneath the line that would take into account the maximum sag and sway of the line. So advance the slide. This was developed over uh, 60 years uh, of research, begun by a couple of researchers called Bramble and Burns, who took a look at a wildlife preserve, and their working hypothesis when they started was that herbicides were going to be detrimental to animals. And what they found is quite the opposite, that where they were able to do what they call cover type conversion to uh, compatible plant communities, also provided habitat for the songbirds, uh, small mammals, pollinators, and so forth. So they found a higher diversity of, of species, environmentally sensitive species, and a greater number of them there than if they didn't use herbicides to do cover type conversion. So next slide. Uh, so the idea is that the first time you come through, broadleaf trees might be coming back fairly densely, and it might require a bit of herbicide. But the next time through, Compatible plant communities will begin to grow and begin to outcompete the non-compatible species for space. And eventually what you do is you manage it very, very easily by having a single individual with a backpack or an ATV treating specific seedlings of incompatible species, one here, one there. So over time, the footprint becomes less and less and less, whereas if you mowed it, you would wind up with an increasingly dense mat of uh, uh, sprouts that are coming up 
that, that would limit access, that would be incompatible with the line, and don't create habitat for the types of, of species that we might be interested in. So next slide. So the idea is what we call cover type conversion, and you can see some, some uh, brown vegetation in front that's been treated, but the idea is to convert it from a plant community of tall growing species that are incompatible with the use of the line to a meadow plant community or a plant community that's entirely consistent with the use of the line and stable over time. And last slide. And uh, give a, a little tip of the hat to Tom Sullivan and his presentation that's coming up. But to re reiterate the point that I made at the beginning of my remarks, that well-maintained rights of way are not sacrifice areas, but areas of opportunity so that we can manage for uh, threatened species or species that need the uh, habitat that's lacking in some cases while limiting fire and providing safe, reliable electric power to our customers. That concludes my remarks. Very interesting. Thank you, Randy. Um, let's move on to our next panelist. Um, that would be Reggie Woodruff. He's the Energy Program Manager for the U.S. Forest Service. Reggie. Okay, and uh, thanks a lot. I'd just like to thank uh, Bill, uh, Troy, and uh, WGA for uh, putting on this webinar and continuing this discussion. I've been with the agency uh, in uh, this section uh, the lands special uses section for about five years now and this discussion has been ongoing and that is encouraging. Uh, I've talked to uh, many folks in the uh, utility transmission vegetation management field and uh, I've, I've learned a lot. Randy introduced me to the uh, idea of cover type conversion and border wire zone uh, for uh, integrated vegetation management. So uh, those things are, are uh, really intriguing to me and they seem like a uh, way to go. So uh, I don't have much uh, in the way of introduction other than to try to give you a little background on the agency and the special uses program. So next slide. So the Forest Service mission is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands to meet the needs of present and future generations. The Forest Service is broken down into nine regions, uh, about, I think it's 154 forests right now, 20 national grasslands, and uh, multiple districts under, the, under those uh, units. And uh, each of those uh, units have uh, authorized officers who are responsible for making decisions that are in the best interest of the um, local lands. Uh, forests and grasslands play a pivotal role in providing a wide range of benefits to Americans. Uh, managing complex and potentially competing demands and land uses is a big challenge for the agency. People want many of the same benefits from these lands and working cooperatively can successfully meet any of the challenges that uh, we uh, all face. The Forest Service Special Uses Program may best exemplify the complexity of the agency's public cooperation and commitment to managing multiple uses on national force. The Agency administers 200 different types of special uses, a total of 70,000 authorizations owned by individuals and companies. Yearly, we receive six, about 6,000 new proposals and manage thousands of reauthorizations and terminations of uh, current or expired permits. Uh, administering this program is a staff of about uh, 400 people, uh, that, that number may not be exact uh, depending on, um, uh, yes, depending on, you know, uh, if we're talking about full-time or part-time staff. And uh, they're responsible for working with the public, state and federal partners, contractors, and multiple programs within the agency to uh, try to administer 
the authorizations. Uh, of those 70,000 authorizations, we have we managed about 2,700 authorizations for power lines, covering about 18,000 linear miles over a, a very diverse uh, array of landscapes. The agency understands that those energy facilities are critical links to the national electricity grid, helping to ensure structures and adjacent natural resources are maintained in a way that protects them from damage or destruction is an important and challenging part of what we do. Uh, again, this involves many stakeholders with competing interests. Uh, a common concern with the management of lands near power lines is the potential uh, for devastating catastrophic fires, wildfires. Fires caused by power lines only accounted for about 2.4% of total fires affecting National Forest System land in 2014. However, we understand that one fire can cause substantial damage to land resources, utility infrastructure, personnel, uh, or personal property, and people. Uh, that's why the agency has made uh, uh, fire prevention a uh, key in the uh, agency's strategic plan 2015 through 2020. Uh, fire mitigation uh, is one of the key objectives, and we hope to mitigate fire by reducing danger from fire through forest restoration, building partnerships at all levels, and promoting shared responsibility for reducing fire risk. Uh, and I'll close with this. Uh, as uh, you all may, have, uh, may know, it was uh, uh, in, in several papers uh, published today about the uh, cost of uh, fighting fires. Uh, forest, the Forest Service is the lead for wildland firefighting. And uh, the cost of fighting fires uh, has grown exponentially since uh, 1995. It's risen uh, by uh, 700 million, uh, accounting for more than half of the agency's budget. Or I'm sorry, it has risen to 700 million uh, annually. And that's uh, more than half of the agency's budget. And in recent years, the agency has supplemented fire costs by taking money from other programs, like the Special Uses Program and Forest Health Pro Protection Programs. And uh, with that, uh, it limits or hinders the agency's ability to uh, work with uh, partners and um, initiate efforts to help reduce uh, the risk for fires. So we are uh, in a, using a large portion of our budget being reactive instead of uh, some of the proactive measures that uh, we're discussing here today. So uh, there, uh, I'll end. There are two issues uh, as we try to work through obstacles to get work done uh, in the area of vegetation management along power lines. Uh, two uh, uh, big issues are uh, timing and uh, liability. Uh, agency, agency's uh, response time to request for vegetation management work varies depending on the capabilities of uh, field offices, number of personnel, the uh, experience of personnel, also the amount of work or complexity of the work that's planned. And a big key is the conditions, the current conditions in the plan area. Uh, with uh, regard to liability, we've worked with uh, Congress and discussed with uh, other partners, uh, federal partners as well as utilities, about uh, trying to do work that extends beyond uh, transmission rights of way. Under Forest Service authorization, uh, utilities are strictly liable for fires that are started by uh, vegetation coming into contact with transmission lines. Uh, so we've tried to work to ensure that vegetation work can be done that extends beyond the right, right of way. But we uh, always and consistently to this day run into the issue of liability. And the agency has been consistent when talking to Congress and the public that, uh, or talking to utilities that 
uh, utilities are uh, to be held liable for uh, work that is done uh, in conjunction with maintaining the integrity of their lines. Uh, if utilities aren't uh, held liable, then that liability is essentially transferred to the public. So uh, we uh, continue to look for opportunities to listen and work with utilities, Congress, and the public to try to overcome these obstacles and uh, so that we can meet our mutual beneficial objectives to maintain uh, forests and grasslands as well as to ensure energy reliability. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Reggie. Um, moving on, uh, our last, um, certainly not least, panelist, Tom Sullivan. He, will, he is the Audit Committee Chair with the Right-of-Way Stewardship Council. Tom. Hi, Ann, thank you. I'm really primarily going to build on uh, Ann's presentation on really the objectives for vegetation management, and that's reliable, uh, reliable delivery of electricity, and then a Randy's presentation on integrated vegetation management and being all about the opportunities for vegetation management and habitat management that right-of-ways can present. Uh, again, that's my name, Tom Sullivan. I'm a retiree from National Grid, one of those back east folks that Ann referred to. Um, and I am currently the chair of the Right-of-Way Stewardship Audit Committee associated with the Right-of-Way Stewardship Program. Next slide, please. So what is Right-of-Way Steward Accreditation? Uh, this council sponsors an accreditation program. And accreditation is really recognition for commitment to and compliance with the right-of-way steward requirements. In a bigger picture, it's really all about environmental stewardship, integrated vegetation management, environmental excellence, and demonstrating that to a set of standards that are the right-of-way steward accreditation standards. The compliance with these is, is audited by an independent third party. The Right-of-Way Stewardship Council uh, sponsors the auditors that go out and do that work. And accreditation, if you achieve it, is awarded by the Right-of-Way Steward Council. And the program is administered by an environmental NGO called Dovetail Partners. Accreditation is really similar to the framework ISO, like 19, ISO 9001 for manufacturing processes or ISO 14001 for environmental management systems. Uh, you probably have all seen FSC Stewardship Council Forest Management Accreditation. You've seen that label on many forest products and paper products. Next slide, please. So the council uh, sponsors this accreditation. The council is composed of a diverse group of stakeholders who actively manage the program. A couple of key components of this are a technical advisory committee, that write the requirements and audit committee that verifies applicants uh, in terms of their compliance with the, with the requirements. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is the full makeup of the council. As I said, it's a broad list of stakeholders. Uh, it begins with uh, environmental NGOs, Wildlife Habitat Council, Nature Conservancy, Pollinator Partnership, university representatives, public at large, some industry players, and then of course down at the bottom here we talk about our technical advisory committee and uh, audit committee. So it's a broad list of people. We're looking for a broad buy-in to the standard and thus participation by a lot of different organizations. Next slide, please. So there's 10 principles of right-of-way stewardship. Uh, the first three relate to compliance with laws, tenure and land use rights, and community relations. That's really stakeholder relations in a big way. These, are, these really come straight out of the forest accreditation systems. The remaining requirements, uh, ten, the remaining seven principles are really strongly related to IVM. They're all underlined there. Management planning, understanding your pest and ecosystem dynamics, setting objectives, 
broad array of techniques accounting for economic and ec ecological effects of your treatments, site-specific treatments, and adaptive management and monitoring. The reference there is to IVM principles is to ANSI A300. The companion doc document to that is one Randy spoke of, and that's the best practices manual that accompanies that IVM standard. Next slide, please. There is a very rigorous audit process. If you'd like to become accredited as a right-of-way steward of your right-of-way system, an application, we work out the cost to get this done, a timeline. There's a huge paperwork submittal to us in order to review your program. We do a gap analysis of your program really on the phone and then do a field audit. There are reports written, reports agreed to, and a final audit report and ultimately resulting in accreditation if you meet the standard. And it's not a cheap program. That's the reason I put this uh, last item on here. It's a fairly expensive program to utilities. Next slide, please. So the field audit is a major performance, a major part of this accreditation program. It's a performance-based accreditation. Uh, the paperwork can all be good, but if we don't see the performance in the field in terms of how you're managing your vegetation and improved wildlife habitat and taking in, into account things like endangered species, invasive species, wildlife habitat, water resources, etc. you will not make the standard to become accredited. So again, we're looking for field performance. These are just a couple photos uh, in Arizona and the different habitats that they manage in Arizona. We really want to make sure your whole staff understands IBM, and we want to make sure your staff understands the right-of-way stewardship concepts and this accreditation. Next slide, please. Oh, somehow we lost a couple. That's all right. Uh, the wrap-up was to uh, show two slides that talked about a little bit more about the field audit, and then also to mention who the companies are that are accredited to date. And the West is well represented among those companies. Uh, the companies that are accredited to date are Arizona Public Service, PG&E in California, Bonneville Power in Oregon, Washington, as well as California and surrounding states. The Sacramento Municipal Utility District uh, in, in Sacramento, California, AltaLink, which is a transmission company in Canada, there are three other companies on the East Coast, but the West is well represented in this accreditation system so far. So we're really all about trying to promote environmental stewardship and taking advantage of this area of opportunity, as Randy calls it, uh, in terms of how these millions of acres across the country can be better managed to meet a broad array of societal benefits, environmental, et cetera. So that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Tom. I appreciate it. Thanks to all the panelists for their opening remarks. Um, before we begin our moderated discussion, I wanted to remind participants that if you do have question and answers questions for our panelists as we move along, please um, send those to uh, the host. It says Dan Bear on your um, chat list there. Um, it's actually Bill Whitaker, but if you would send those um, individual questions to the Dan Bear host, then we'll um, do our best to get those um, put on a list and hopefully we'll have time at the end to um, have a question and answer session to address those questions. Um, with that, let's go ahead and get started with our moderated discussion. We have some prepared questions here um, that hopefully our uh, panelists can provide um, some insight for. Um, just starting out with some overview questions. So vegetation management, as we all know, along transmission rights of way is a hugely important um, for, for the whole nation, um, but especially in the West, it has direct effects on maintaining reliable electric, electric service and goes a long way to preventing wildfire. So I'm gonna pose this question to the panelists in general. Whoever wants to can go ahead and chime in, but what vegetation management factors do you see as most needing to be addressed by transmission stakeholders, states, and or federal partners? 
and Randy here, uh, Randy Miller. I, I think there are two things. One is to get uh, to educate land managers and the public of what I think is a fundamental principle that utility rights away are not sacrifice areas because we can't grow trees in there. To just educate the public and land managers that trees don't belong there because of the consequences that can occur when they interfere with the conductors. We can have widespread power outages. We can have fires. There's all kinds of very dramatic consequences that can occur when trees interfere. It, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to take a tree and then cut it in half and allow it to grow back up in the power line. It's always there. It's still going to be a threat. And when you have hundreds of thousands of miles of line that cross a continent or vast reaches of a continent uh, and millions of potential trees, any one of which could cause an outage or a fire, it really doesn't make sense to allow a lot of that to remain behind in our rights of way. So we need to manage it from a more common sense perspective. Uh, fires and catastrophic outages, even on a regional basis of widespread outages, is unacceptable. And secondly, in the West, the uh, uh, mountain pine beetle epidemic that is killing untold millions of trees throughout here uh, is a threat to our transmission corridors and even our, our distribution lines. Uh, trees can fall down at any time, when, and, and it's costing millions and millions of dollars. And so we have to cooperate with one another to try to mitigate what I think is a, 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 a catastrophe in terms of you know, the species and the number of trees that are being killed by mountain pine beetles. So those two key concepts. One is to take a, a common sense approach that trees that could interfere with the conductor at some time in their life through growth have no business in a transmission right away. And secondly, an awareness of the mountain pine beetle epidemic that really threatens fire and service reliability on our transmission lines. Those are two things that occur, occur to me. That's very interesting. I love the um, the uh, phrase there, not sacrifice areas. That's, that's very interesting. Um, any other of the panelists want to chime in here? Well, uh, this is Reggie. Um, I uh, I'll certainly support what uh, Randy uh, has said. Uh, again, I've uh, worked with uh, Randy off and on over the last few years, having discussions about uh, the importance of maintaining uh, vegetation within uh, rights of way. Uh, and I'll go back to a um, slide that uh, you presented where there was uh, clear cutting of vegetation uh, along the, the right of way. And certainly that's uh, very, um, uh, very much supportive of uh, reducing the risk of, of fire. And uh, that's a nice fire break for uh, of, uh, any firefighters who are uh, uh, trying to, uh, you know, uh, combat fire that may enter that area. But uh, that is uh, not desirable for most landscapes. And so uh, taking that uh, integrated vegetation management approach, uh, educating, uh, you know, utilities uh, further, uh, as well as educating uh, Forest Service staff on the benefits of integrated vegetation management uh, is something that uh, I think we can do more of. Also, uh, educating uh, utilities about the uh, need for early uh, engagement with uh, Forest Service personnel. Uh, and I'm sure this holds true for other uh, uh, federal land managers as well. But uh, engaging early in the process to try to to develop a cooperative plan, evaluate the uh, current conditions, identifying high-risk areas, and then uh, developing a strategy to go in and alleviate those high-risk areas first, and uh, also develop a plan for regular maintenance of the existing line, of the uh, remainder of the line. So uh, uh, more education and, uh, with uh, IVM and uh, greater education about the, the need for early and frequent communications with land managers. Great. Thank you very much, Reggie. I agree with you on the education part as well as the 
early engagement um, of the Forest Service personnel working cooperatively. Uh, let's move on to the next question. What steps has your organization taken in recent years to more effectively or efficiently achieve necessary vegetation management objectives? Well, Ann Randy here again. Uh, you had mentioned using LIDAR in your presentation. We have done that as well. And invariably what we find is what you found, and that is that there are trees that have looked to ground inspectors and aerial inspectors to have plenty of clearance. Uh, but when you plug the maximum sag and sway of the line into a computer and you run something that's uh, completely accurate, say, could this tree interfere with the conductor or interfere with the mandated clearance requirements from the federal government? And we find that there's violations out there or trees that could possibly encroach or are within our work thresholds, trees that we thought were safe when we took a look at them on the ground. So that's one thing that we have done that's effective. And, and I'd also say that just using proper best practices for integrated vegetation management has been invaluable for us. And we have converted frights away from uh, 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 trees to cone flowers and providing the type of habitat that I described earlier. And um, uh, you know, to Reggie's point, uh, if the structures are high enough off the ground, and in many cases where you have steel lattice structures that are 100 feet off the ground or something, we can grow a border zone plant community uh, close to the structures, and that way you can mitigate or soften that, that bowling alley effect that I think that uh, some of the federal land managers object to. And, and that might not happen the first time through, but that's a, an objective to which to work, saying, okay, the first time through we have to take trees, and the trees are dominating the, the right-of-way. Now we can work through and try to get some of the lower-growing uh, trees and small, uh, tall-growing shrubs that can soften that bowling alley effect as you go through there. So a you know, long-term objective, it can't necessarily all be done at once, but if we're working together, I think that we can cooperate and achieve the types of things that we need in terms of protecting the uh, safe, reliable electric power, uh, safety from fire, and also some of the, the other objectives that we might have in terms of of, of aesthetics and, and, and other uses that the, the federal agencies and others are interested in. Thanks, Randy. I appreciate that. Yeah, in, in reference to that particular slide, that bowling alley look, um, I think Randy's exactly right. When you have a right of way that has never been maintained since the inception of the line, um, you're going to have majority of tree species, especially in that case where there are pinion junipers dominating the right of way. There were no other kinds of vegetation in the area. We do live in the desert southwest, and so we don't have a lot of um, other types or varieties uh, of vegetation um, on those rights away at this time. But we have found that after we've gone through and cleared the um, pinion juniper from the rights of way, we're seeing um, a flourish of, of grasses and other kinds of uh, plants that weren't necessarily present when the trees were there. And so that's all part of those IBM principles, is, is removal of those um, incompatible species. So um, let's move on to the next question. Um, what steps have, do you have to take in order to assess and take out hazard trees adjacent to the rights of way on public lands? And is this process different on private lands? And Tom, you can jump in. I know you represent the uh, the uh, uh, Railway Stewardship Council, but I know you have lots of experience to draw from on in this respect, too. Yeah, and I, I can address that. Um, if you were to map right-of-way systems in the Northeast, and if you were to do some kind of uh, LIDAR data on fall-ins, trees that could fall in and hit the wires, you would find that and I know there's some National Grid people on this call, but uh, you would find hundreds of miles and millions of trees that could actually fall and hit the wires that are outside the right-of-way. So in the Northeast, that process is all about finding the high-risk trees and working with the neighboring landowners to try to develop a healthier edge along the edge of the right-of-way. Uh, in our case, you know, we're mostly private, so a lot of times it's a one-on-one -on -one negotiation with landowners. In some places you have uh, easements that allow you to take those trees. But it's really about developing a healthy edge so that you have a lower risk of those trees falling in and striking the lines. 
Uh, public, I'm sure, presents more challenges. Uh, we manage some lines in New York inside the Adirondack Park, and you know, there's a lot of a lot of negotiation and work with the public agencies to be able to take those trees down. But when I say managing the risk, it's about looking at individual trees, assessing it by species, assessing it by condition, and deciding which trees ought to go to try to leave healthy trees that will have less risk of falling into the lines. Yeah, and then Randy here, I'll build on what, what Tom is saying. Certainly in a lot of our areas in the mountains and the Intermountain area, uh, Utah, Wyoming, Idaho, uh, and, and then, of course, west of the Cascades and in the Cascades in, in Oregon, there's, there's no way we can manage rights of way that we would eliminate the chance of any tree falling in. I, I know Reggie would agree that on the, in the Umpqua National Forest, cutting down 250 tall, 800-year-old uh, uh, Douglas fir, and just because they could potentially hit the line and they're 100 feet off to the side, isn't uh, justifiable environmentally, and we couldn't afford it if it was. Uh, but on the other hand, we need to be mindful that we have a responsibility to identify trees, as Tom described. And, and in that case, the best practices for hazard tree uh, assessment from the International Society of Arboriculture are helpful. Uh, they have three levels of assessment, a, a, a level one, a level two, and an advanced assessment. A level one is uh, more set aside for people that manage large groups of trees like utilities. And so that's a drive-by assessment or an aerial assessment looking for trees with obvious defects that we could remove. And again, there's no possible way with millions of trees or hundreds of thousands of trees we're going to identify every one. Even if we did an advanced assessment on it, we couldn't guarantee that there's uh, no trees that could possibly fall. But I do think that we have a responsibility to do that. And so on our system, that's what we try to do. We conduct a level one assessment, and then if we identify trees that look to be candidates for removal, we'll take a closer look at them. If they're on federal lands, then we'll coordinate with the land uh, management agency or state lands. Uh, the land management agency to to remove them. I'd, I'd be interested in Reggie's view about about how uh, we should be dealing with hazard trees, and you know, because those are trees, especially with mountain pine beetle, that uh, could be causing fires for us and causing causing problems. So, Reggie, what are your thoughts? Well, Randy, as uh, as you know, uh, in uh, 2013, we uh, developed and released a. Uh, vegetation management guide that uh, tried to address uh, how to uh, work with utilities in developing operating and maintenance plans, uh, vegetation plans, to uh, do uh, routine work. And, and uh, part of that work includes removal of uh, trees that uh, have been identified or defined by us and also in your NERP standards as uh, trees that cause imminent threat, so those trees that are uh, so degraded by uh, whatever conditions, certainly uh, mountain pine beetle is a, uh, a, a serious issue and condition with uh, trees out west that uh, could cause the tree to fall uh, onto a structure at any moment. And uh, we promoted uh, removal of those uh, trees immediately uh, without prior notification of, uh, to the agency, uh, but uh, removing those uh, uh, trees and then contacting the agency later to uh, discuss that removal. Uh, where it uh, gets a little, I guess, uh, complicated is when we uh, start to talk about uh, the definition of what hazard trees are, and uh, uh, so certainly we want to uh, work with you to prevent trees that could uh, that are are damaged and, and could fall into a uh, structure and you know interrupt service as well as uh, cause fire uh, very damaging to land resources and people and property. Uh, but uh, in those instances, uh, it uh, is very situational, based on landscapes, uh, based on um, uh, you know what what type of resources again that we're that we're dealing with to be able to uh, assess uh, if those trees need to be removed immediately or you know if uh, there's a, a, a timetable based on uh, the availability of our personnel to be able to get out and work with you and see uh, when those uh, trees or 
uh, quite frankly, if those trees should be removed. So uh, again, uh, a matter of cooperation and understanding what the uh, uh, risks are uh, for the uh, agency uh, or in, in trying to manage the land as well as the risk to these structures. And, and certainly, again, we don't want uh, uh, trees falling into power lines. That's not a benefit for uh, either party involved. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, um, panelists. Let's move on. Um, changing directions, let's talk a little bit about um, the MOU or Memorandum of Understanding. In 2006, the Edison Electric Institute and several federal agencies entered into a Memorandum of Agreement intended to help the parties better address vegetation management needs and concerns on public lands. Um, Reggie, you touched on this and, and being able to work together collaboratively. In your opinion, where did the 2006 MOU achieve benefit and where did it fall short and why? So uh, in my intro, I, I uh, said that I'd been uh, in my position for five years, uh, not necessarily uh, my position as energy program manager, but certainly dealing with special uses for five years. So the uh, 2006 uh, MOU predates me. So uh, that might be a better question for uh, one of the other panelists. I will say that I've been uh, uh, engaged in the uh, redevelopment of the MOU, which was just uh, signed off on by all parties and released. And I'm happy to say that uh, with that, uh, it has uh, demonstrated that uh, cooperation between uh, EEI partners and the uh, federal partners. Uh, we were all very uh, passionate about making sure that it got done. N uh, no, no party uh, believed that this was, uh, I guess I'd say, a waste of time. Uh, we, we, we all felt that it was important to have it done and to uh, share that document with our, uh, you know, throughout the agencies to ensure that we promote uh, greater cooperation uh, uh, development of uh, long-term plans for addressing uh, issues with vegetation management, uh, identifying uh, or promoting that uh, this uh, is a benefit, a uh, mutual benefit to uh, both land managers as well as utilities uh, and uh, the uh, entities that we represent. So. Uh, with that, uh, I mean, I, I'll just say that the uh, development of the MOU was a, uh, though it took longer than uh, we uh, had hoped, uh, there were, uh, were some difficulties that we faced. Uh, those difficulties, however, were not due to a lack of interest uh, on both sides to make sure that the uh, document got done and that uh, it was used in a way that promoted uh, better cooperation in managing vegetation along rights of way. I'll have to echo uh, Reggie's um, comments there. The member of this um, project team working on the revised MOU, um, there's been a lot of effort, many, many hours, several trips um, in order to get this document signed. Um, I participated along with Randy and several others on this call um, to come up with a document, as Reggie said, that would be beneficial to all parties involved in, in the memorandum. But Randy, if you could maybe give us a brief um, kind of, in your opinion, difference between what the original intent was of the MOU and where do you think we've arrived with this new version? Sure, yeah, and, and, and I was, uh, I think you know, and, and Tom probably does as well, that I chaired the uh, Edison Electric Institute Vegetation Management Task Force when we were in discussion of the first MOU. And I think when we first started our conversations back then, there was a lot of misunderstanding between the objectives of the federal agencies and uh, misunderstanding with the federal agencies among the objectives that we had. And so the most important thing that began was a dialogue, at least at a, at a national level, among, among staffers, officials from federal agencies, 
in Washington, D.C., about what we needed to do, what our mutual objectives were, and, and, and where we could find common ground. Uh, and you had pointed out the, the, the term sacrifice area. That's not mine. Now, that came from a wildlife biologist at a meeting that we had in, in Washington, D.C., when we were talking about cover type conversion and we were trying to get through and, and, and educate about what, what really our objectives were. And, and this wildlife biologist, he represented Fish and Wildlife again, just sort of stopped and looked at me and said, you mean to say that we should stop looking at rights of way as sacrifice areas because we can't grow trees there, but look at them as areas of opportunity where we can manage for different wildlife species. And like, it was an aha moment. So just stuff like that, and moments like that were things that were the main benefit, I think, of, of the MOU. And it wasn't perfect, and, and, and my, uh, uh, from my perspective, some, some uh, not utilities, but some land managers at managing districts looked at the MOU and said, okay, here's, here's areas that we can find common ground, and they were inclined to look at utilities and, and, and want to cooperate. Others just ignored it entirely. And so I think that the benefit of the second MOU, first of all, the language is much more clear. And it lays out, I think, the specific responsibilities of the federal agencies and the utilities in a much better way uh, than, uh, than the other one had. It, it talks about utility being a vital service, but also I think helps educate utilities about you know, the federal agencies just aren't trying to be intransigent. They have responsibilities as well, and we need to recognize those responsibilities and work with them. Uh, but there are, 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 are items about safety and, and promoting cooperation and the nationwide importance of both federal agency land, federally managed land, and the electrical grid. And so I think that the benefit of the, of the, of the second MOU is, is greater clarity, a reinforcement on the part of utilities and on the part of land management agencies that cooperation is important and to get that down to a level of the, the people in the field that are interfacing. The other important development, I think, in the new MOU is the addition of the American Power Association and the National Rural Collective, uh, Electric Cooperative Association along with the um, investor-owned utilities that are members of the Edison Electric Institute. I think that's a very important development to get all the utilities that are involved signed on and get everybody cooperating with the, with the objective in mind of providing safe and reliable electric power using best management practices for integrated vegetation management. That's my view having worked on both of the MOUs and, and, and my experience at Pacific Corp. That's great. And this is and this is Reggie, I'll just uh, uh, like to highlight one sure. one other thing. Uh, in a couple of years ago, there was uh, the president issue an executive order uh, uh, to asking the agency agencies with uh, increasing and improving pollinator habitats. Yes. And uh, so with uh, 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 pollinator uh, mortality. <laughs> I see you're stealing my thunder, Reggie. That was one of the questions I had. Oh, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So uh, you can either go on or, or, or I can keep you at it here. You can go ahead and uh, talk about that because I think that's important. But one of the questions okay. I had was in light of the presidential memo that came out in 2014, how is that affected um, integrated vegetation management or um, programs across the country? And so this is a great segue into that question. Okay, so I'll, I'll segue uh, by uh, highlighting in the uh, MOU that was a uh, something that uh, that all parties uh, agree was important to uh, uh, put in language that uh, encouraged uh, both parties to or all parties to work together in ensuring uh, pollinators' uh, habitats were considered when uh, doing vegetation uh, management work. And again, uh, you know, I keep going back to uh, Randy's conversation about uh, IVM and, 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 and wire border zone and uh, looking at opportunities uh, for managing rights away and not just uh, sacrificing trees. But um, so in the uh, MOU, there's language that uh, promotes uh, cooperation in developing uh, uh, suitable habitats within rights-of-way 
uh, low-growing uh, 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 trees and plants that would attract pollinators. And so uh, I just wanted to foot stomp that uh, that's one example of how this uh, MOU, I think, is, is better and just how it uh, demonstrates a, a willingness on both sides to promote things that are in uh, the, the best interests of, uh, I would say, the nation. Uh, certainly, uh, pollinators uh, don't necessarily promote uh, better electricity, but understanding that uh, as a, uh, a user of the land, that uh, utilities understand uh, the, the mission and requirements of the Forest Service to do things that are uh, in the best interest of promoting wildlife. So uh, I'll foot solve for that. That's great, and that's perfect. And um, I encourage um, Tom um, to jump in here and talk about how integrated vegetation management um, can increase the pollinator habitat, if you'd like to, or Randy, either one. Yeah, Ian, yeah, thanks. Uh, this is Tom. Um, really, when when you when you take out that overstory of trees, and in some in, in a lot of instances, this is more true in the Northeast because you know, left to no management, we would be 100% forest in the Northeast. When you take that tree layer out, um, we can encourage literally hundreds of species of shrubs and forbs and other herbaceous plants just by making sure those trees don't regrow. We have thousands and thousands of acres of habitat in the Northeast, uh, early successional habitat, that are have been managed using IBM and using herbicides for decades. Uh, and of course now, if you want to, you can, you can aim that management more to flowering plants, uh, whether it's for butterflies or whether it's for pollinators. Um, I had a long history with a Massachusetts Audubon sanctuary where their primary objective was butterfly habitat. And we basically carried out our normal program of encouraging low-growing plants with some minor enhancements in terms of habitat management. And we helped them turn that into the most well-known butterfly habitat in the state. Um, and again, it's just all about getting the trees out, managing low-growing vegetation that's compatible, and maybe making some minor changes to your program if you wanted to particularly work on getting flowering plants for pollinator habitat or butterfly habitat. Yeah, I agree, I agree Tom. Randy here. Uh, I think we need to remember that a lot of these plant communities exploit forest openings so that when a tree or a group of trees fall, these, these low-growing uh, shrubs or flowers other types of species wind up growing to take advantage of a new forest opening. And that can be true in mountainous areas uh, here or in, in Oregon and the areas that are heavily forested. And it works the same way as it does back east. I think I'd mentioned in my opening remarks that we have we have areas in the mountains here that I have seen that were, were dense with, with gamble oak and, and, and pines, and they're coneflowers now. And, and we did nothing except for do our regular integrated vegetation management, take out the, the tall growing trees and then treat um, the invasive seedlings that might be coming in. And now it's grown in with grasses, cone flowers, and some small shrubs that flower, providing habitat for pollinators and, and meadow, meadow uh, or uh, uh, animals that exploit meadow plant communities and use that as their, as their environment. So in some cases, it doesn't take anything at all. In other cases, as Tom said, it would take some minor adjustments to identify the species of, of, of note, maybe even do some seeding of some species that would you consider desirable. But the integrated vegetation management would work just fine. And of course, cone flowers and small growing shrubs and some of the plants that, that would provide the type of habitat that we're looking for for pollinators are entirely compatible with the use of the right-of-way. So this is a win-win for, for utilities. And it's also a win-win for the public because you know, we're going to reduce the chance of fire by growing those plants, plant communities, and we're going to make sure that we provide safe, reliable electric power when they're growing in there because they're never in their lifetime going to interfere with the conductors. Sounds great. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you for that discussion. Um, we're going to transition now into our question and answer session. We have received a number of questions, um, and thank you to those participants who've um, 
offered up some uh, some questions for our panelists, some of which I think have been answered through the um, chat screen. I know there was a question about the right-of-way stewardship program and what would motivate utilities um, to want to be accredited through that program, and I think Tom provided an answer for that, so hopefully that will um, suffice for that particular question. But I'm going to move to another question um, along the same lines as the MOU, but um, involving um, uh, some legislation that has been introduced. Um, in, tw in 2015, Congressman Zinke introduced the Electric Reliability and Force Protection Act, which enjoyed bipartisan support and has since been attached to the House's energy reform legislation. What do you think are the benefits of Representative Zinke's bill and how could it be improved? Randy, I'll let you take that one. And then sure. Edgy. Yeah, I, I'll start and then Reggie can, can chime in. He may not agree with all my comments, I don't know. But for, for me, some of the benefits in there would be just just an encouragement of, uh, well, providing legislation for federal managers to uh, refer to when they're trying to make decisions. You know, federal managers are out trying to enforce the law or abide by the law, you know, make decisions consistent with the law as best they possibly can. And so to help them be able to make decisions, I think it's important to modify some of the laws so that they can help utilities do environmentally sound integrated vegetation management, help protect the public from fire and, and provide safe, reliable electrical power. So uh, legislation, I think, is critical because most federal, aid, uh, federal uh, uh, authorities, in my view, regardless of whether or not they make decisions that I agree with, are doing their best to comply with the law. And so if we make a law that helps them make a decision that would uh, expedite providing safe, reliable electric power, I think that's beneficial for the public good. Um, some of the things that are in the uh, 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 Representative Zinke's bill would be expedited removals and, and categorical exclusion from some NEPA. The idea is that the presence of a power line should wind up indicating that we should be able to maintain that line. And why should we continue to be using federal resources, which are limited, and the utilities resources, which are limited, in uh, uh, unnecessary authorization for work that's just ongoing maintenance? So that, to me, I think is, is, is pretty good advice. I mean, we're not talking about uh, uh, exploiting or destroying the environment. We're talking about using best practices for integrated vegetation management for cover type conversion like I described. And I think that if, as long as we agree to that, we can make long, get long-term authorizations that wouldn't need uh, overly frequent visiting by federal, federal authorities and by the utilities. Uh, we talked about emergency response procedures and, 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 and Reggie discussed the, the, uh, uh, the uh, 2013 um, uh, key management plans that the Forest Service put together, which is an, or the federal agencies put together, which is an excellent document and discusses expedited removal of, of trees that could be uh, imminent threats to electrical service and, 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 and cause fires. And that's part of Zinke's bill as well, recommendations for that. Um, so those are some of the things that I think are very, very important, the categorical exclusions, expedited removal, er, uh, emergency response, and then longer-term authorization for our work. There is some um, uh, concern on the part of some utility uh, utilities, and we've had discussion with the EEI, uh, that the hazard tree definition is overly broad and would expand to distribution lines and say that any tree that it could fall within 10 feet of the power lines needs to be considered when we're doing our hazard tree program. And, and sure, but in the context of a level one assessment or those trees that have a reasonably high chance of falling into the line, I think the concern is, and I don't think that this is intended in the bill and I don't think it would be accepted by the Forest Service, but the concern is, is that some utilities would be held accountable for removing every tree that could have the potential to fall into the conductors on distribution, or not just into the conductors, within 10 feet of the conductors, on distribution and transmission lines. And as Reggie has alluded to, and, and as we have talked about earlier in our conversation, uh, there's no way in the East or in Oregon or anywhere else that we're going to be able to justify cutting down rights of way and, uh, that, that involve every single tree, regardless of its health, that could possibly fall on the line. 
And so I think there's concern about the definition of hazard tree would drive that. When I read it, I don't necessarily see that myself, but there is some concern in the utility sector that the law would drive that. And so I think that we need to try to refine that, use a definition of a hazard tree as a tree that's been identified as having defects that could, could uh, fall into the conductor with the understanding that utilities are managing millions and millions of trees and, and there's not enough tree risk assessors that are qualified to be able to do a, an advanced assessment on every one of those millions of trees in the world. So we, we, we have to use our, our, our due diligence in terms of drive-bys and flyovers to try to identify trees with obvious defects and do our best to limit trees that could fall into the conductors, cause an outage, or create a fire. So in terms of improvement, I think that the, the hazard tree discussion probably would, would, would need to be improved and, and to work with industry and work with uh, forests and, and arboricultural experts to try to nail that down to something more reasonable uh, so that we have a, a standard of care that, that would protect the public, but on the other hand, not drive something that would be environmentally unjustifiable and overly uh, uh, expensive. That's a great assessment. Thanks, Randy. Reggie, do you have any um, commentary in, from your viewpoint on that proposed legislation from Representative or Congressman Zinke? Certainly, uh, I, I, I agree with of some with some of the the good Randy uh, pointed to. Uh, certainly, with promoting consistency. Uh, uh, across uh, federal agencies and uh, working with utilities to manage rights of way for uh, vegetation. Um, uh, certainly that's a, a benefit, uh, pr promoting a greater use of uh, categorical exclusions. Uh, again, as, as Randy stated, uh, we uh, aren't in the business of being obstructionist uh, uh, authorized officers are doing what's in the best interest of the land within uh, the uh, existing authorities by law. So um, uh, th those are, are good things, certainly. Uh, um, I'm actually going on the Hill to uh, discuss the uh, language that's uh, from the Zinke Bill that's moved to uh, S-2012, the, uh, the, the over uh, overall energy policy. Uh, so, um, you know, I I I I, I, I tread lightly in, in in talking about things that are are problematic. Uh, again, we as as federal agencies, we, we work with Congress to uh, explain uh, what the impacts of uh, legislation will be, and not to you know say hate it or love it. But certainly, we feel like there are some redundancies in in the bill, and um, uh, there is an appearance or or, or it, it there a feel that the time constraints are uh, driven uh, in the bill and not necessarily considering uh, the requirements of the agencies. Uh, or the constraints that uh, some of the field units are under. So uh, those are some things that we'll be talking about and, and maybe how to overcome those, uh, as well as uh, with categorical exclusions, we currently have a five-acre limit with categorical exclusions uh, dealing with uh, special uses authorizations, which are uh, uh, transmission lines are under special use authorization. So, that five acre limit is uh, very constraining. So uh, if uh, we could uh, do something, work together to expand that categorical exclusion authority, then that would be helpful. Yeah, and to put that into context, Reggie, Randy here again, 100 foot right away is 12 acres a mile. Uh, so just uh, bear that in mind during your discussion, but I, I wasn't aware of that, so that's a really good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Great, thank you so much for your guys' comments. Um, Tom, did you have anything to add to that com that conversation? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> Let's move on. Sorry, Ann. That's Sorry, Ann, it's that old mute button, you know. <laughs> now, I would just go back to the, on the uh, agreement process with the federal agencies. The MOU is really all about, initially, it was all about starting a dialogue. 
Um, you know, federal managers and state managers of land had their needs and their own pressures, their own stakeholders. We had our own needs and our own stakeholders. We didn't have a lot of dialogue. We didn't have a lot of understanding of each other at all. And, you know, through a couple of iterations of that agreement, we're closer, and maybe we'll get to the point where we have a streamlined process for helping each other find the win-wins and making all this work. That's awesome. I, I think all sides agree on that. Um, let's move on to another question from the um, participants on the webinar. Um, I'll do my best to try to um, clarify this, but it said, has a west-wide ass assessment been made where the biggest transmission dis destruction risks exist? Um, and then follow-up questions on that. If the answer is yes, is the, is the prioritization done by state? And have the tribal reservations been involved in this effort for assessing risks? Uh, many tribes have extensive, extensive forests, especially in Arizona and Colorado. Um, I can comment on that from my perspective. We, um, in New Mexico, as you saw from my presentation, we have a number of um, uh, tribes that are, exist in our state that we cross with our rights of way. Um, as many of you may know, in the West or in everywhere, um, each individual tribe or pueblo is its own sovereign government. And so we, as right-of-way managers, have to um, visit with each individual Pueblo or tribe as if it's, it, because it is its own government and try to work through um, any issues that might be out there related to vegetation management. And each individual Pueblo and or tribe has their own concerns and their own priorities. And so it's up to us in the industry to make sure that we're, um, again, communicating um, through the spirit of this MOU and trying to reach a win-win situation for all the stakeholders on both sides of the issue. Um, but does anybody else have any comments or any knowledge of a, kind of a west-wide um, assessment of risk? Uh, Randy here, I don't. Uh, not, not a region or west-wide uh, uh, assessment. I, I know that in 2000, the BPA put together a an EIS, uh, Environmental Impact Statement, in cooperation with the BLM and the Forest Service, which is an excellent document that take, took a look at, you know, control options and what the risks are. And I do know that the BLM has done a programmatic environment uh, impact statement, and they did look at, at uh, uh, utility uh, vegetation management, and most of their conclusions in both those documents are consistent with what I would consider to be best practice. But I don't know of any coordinated west-wide uh, assessment of risk to transmission lines, um, uh, other than anecdotal, you know, sharing between uh, utilities, uh, your conversations in mine and or conversations with other system foresters around the West. So it's entirely anecdotal, I think, as we try to share information with one another. Reggie or Tom, do you have any follow-up questions or comments? This is Reggie. The uh... Uh, the Forest Service did uh, uh, do some study uh, uh, late 2014 into uh, early 2015 trying to as assess the uh, number of miles of uh, uh, transmission or power lines on National Forest System lands that were uh, as at high risk, medium risk, and uh, low risk. and um, I don't have that data with me, but we work with uh, Western Electricity Coordinating Council to uh, come up with some numbers. Uh, we did not. Uh, uh, well, let me let me pause. I think we did do some mapping uh, that uh, identified some areas. Uh, uh, the level of detail was was not very high. So uh, th there is some things that we've done internally to try to uh, identify high-risk areas and to uh, promote better cooperation or, or, or engagement with utilities actually to uh, get work done in those areas. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. And I want to take this time right now to thank all of our panelists, um, Randy Miller, Reggie Woodruff, and Tom Sullivan for their time and their preparation for this webinar. And also, I want to thank the Western Governors Association for um, holding this particular webinar, and thanks to Bill Whitaker and his staff. And I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you all. <coughs> Bill, you've got a staff now. And this is Troy Timmons at WGA. Um, and we really need to um, thank you for taking the time to moderate this whole discussion. Um, you've done a great job, and we really appreciate you, Randy, Reggie, and um, Tom, all of you, for joining us. Also, for everybody that uh, tuned in, we really appreciate your time as well. Um, we will be, this is the first in a, in a series, so um, please go to our website. Um, we have a dedicated initiative webpage uh, that will be updated as, as we line up more of these webinars um, and uh, the workshops that we're holding as well. Um, there's a resources page there. Um, if you had questions that did not get answered during this session, um, we have uh, an address, nfrm at westgov.org. It's also on the website, nfrm at westgov.org, and we would ask you to um, submit those questions there, and we will uh, try to get them answered. Bill, what am I leaving out? Um, that's, uh, that's about it, Troy, and I just remind everybody uh, who attended um, to look for an email in the next day or so. It'll have a link to watch the webinar again on YouTube and a summary of all the highlights of this webinar. But aside from that, uh, this is the first in a series, so please look for more um, webinars for the Forest and Lane Rangeland Management Initiative from WGA, and stay tuned. But thanks, everybody. Uh, I thought this was a great webinar. Thanks for your time, and I look uh, forward to the next one.